We're now going to proceed to the second and final panel, and we'll try to uh, get you out of here by noon. And so we have to watch our own timing, the committee, but uh, now that we've narrowed down to just uh, three of us, I think we can do that. Uh, it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify, and I'd like to ask all of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Okay? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And um, I'll now take a moment to introduce our prestigious and distinguished panelists. I would first like to start with Mr. Dan Glickman, who serves as the chairman and CEO of the Motion Picture Association of America. And prior to becoming the leading voice for the motion picture industry and some of my congressional district's most uh, prominent employers, uh, Mr. Glickman proudly served as a member of Congress from the 4th Congressional District of Kansas for 18 years, as well as the Secretary of Agriculture in the Clinton administration. In addition to his current position with MPAA, he serves on the boards of the American Film Institute, uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Communities in Schools, and the Center for U.S. Global Engagement. He is also a member of the Genocide Prevention Task Force, uh, which is chaired by Secretaries Madeleine Albright and Bill Cohen, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. Uh, Mr. Robert W. Holliman is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Business Software Alliance. He is widely known for his work on policy-related issues affecting the technology industry, including intellectual property laws, cybersecurity, international trade, and electronic commerce. And before joining BSA, he spent eight years serving as consul in the U.S. Senate and was an attorney with a leading uh, law firm in Houston, Texas. Mr. Brian Tohey is the Senior Vice President for International Affairs at the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, referred to as Pharma. And prior to joining Pharma, Mr. Tohey uh, served in multiple government affairs roles in the medical device and telecommunications industry. 
Before entering the private sector, he served as both a desk officer and deputy director in the equipment officers of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And finally, Mr. Frank Varco is the Vice President for International Affairs at the National Association of Manufacturers. He serves as its lead lobbyist and spokesman on issues of trade, currency, and other issues related to global markets and access. And prior to joining NAM, Mr. Varco had a three-decade trade policy career at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And so without objection, before proceeding to testimony from our panelists, I would like to submit a statement for the record on behalf of a coalition of music ministries representatives that include performing artists, publishers, songwriters, composers, and record labels. And what is telling to me from their testimony is how critical IPR protection and enforcement is to industry stakeholders across the entertainment spectrum, including independent art, uh, artists and major recording studios alike. And I'm proud to have the music industry as a major constituent uh, in our California's 33rd Congressional District and welcome the many cultural and economic contributions they uh, provide to our nation. And uh, as I travel abroad uh, and introduce myself as representing Los Angeles, California and Culver City, and I get nice nods, but when I say Hollywood, big smiles. So our industry reaches every honor of the globe and pretty much represents who we are, at least we try to put forth the movies that represent the true beliefs of America. So uh, I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration, if possible, and your complete written statements will be included in the hearing record. And so, Mr. Glickman, I'd like to start with you and welcome. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, thank you very much uh, for your leadership on film and entertainment issues. Uh, it's a great honor for me after spending 18 years in the House of Representatives to come back here um, and uh, to be in the greatest deliberative. Does it feel like home? It feels like home, and it also it <laughs> makes me yearn to come back, although I have no intention of uh, going down that road. But I, I would say that... Uh, <laughs> but you, you all have the greatest jobs in the world, and it, you realize it more when you're out in yeah. terms of the impact that you have on Well, I understand lives. you'll be leaving soon, and what are you going to pursue uh, if well, I can get into your private business? Uh, we'll talk privately about okay. that afterwards. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, and not for, not for a while, so I'll, I'll still be around. But first of all, let me say that um, the intellectual property industries represented by those of us here are so critically important to the country. In the case of motion pictures, directly and indirectly, we employ about 2.5 million people in this country, we are one of the few industries that has a positive balance of payment surplus with every single country in the world we do business with. Uh, the movies are produced and television shows are produced in all 50 states now, employment in all 50 states. And if you talk about a symbol of America, entertainment is probably as profound and powerful symbol of, of everything to do with our great country. So th this is a really important industry, an important issue for us as well. And these jobs are good jobs, high paying jobs, and important to the country as well. So I, I wanted to, and by the way, over half of our revenues are derived from outside the United States. So what happens in the rest of the world, these trade issues are life or death for us uh, because people do love our product. So what are, what are the things that I, I was listening to the, the work of the government officials, and by the way, they've done a very good job. Uh, uh, USTR, Justice, the other agencies here, I must say, both in the Bush administration and in the Obama administration have picked up these issues and the importance of intellectual property right protection. Um, they, we can always do more. We talk about that, and I'm going to talk about some additional suggestions. The first thing is we now have a coordinator. We've talked about that under the pro-IP bill. We have an IP coordinator. This is very important. There's somebody that's accountable that we can focus on, that we can go to, 
and uh, can help uh, lead and, and marshal resources and enforcement policy throughout the United States government. The question now is to make sure that uh, she and her organization realize the full potential of this position by funding its remaining elements uh, in the pro-IP bill, the, the agents, the uh, enforcement authorities that are provided in that bill. It's also important that the nomination for Deputy U.S. Trade Representative for IP be confirmed. Her name is Miriam Sapiro. She's a critical senior level official in the U.S. interagency team. That position has not been confirmed yet. That's very important to get that done. We've talked about the special 301 process. This is a critical tool which identifies deficiencies in, in foreign markets and serves uh, as the administration's overall roadmap. And uh, just uh, uh, to give you some idea, I was over in Spain recently. Spain has is is, is very serious problems involving Internet piracy. President Obama met with the President of Spain, Mr. Zapatero, raised the issue of Internet piracy. Spain is on the Special 301 list, and it's high, because of that government-to-government -government coordination and impact, it's, it's highlighted th their uh, hopeful desire to fix some of the problems that we have here. We have something called the General System of Preferences, GSP program which is intended to offer trade benefits to developing countries while at the same time protecting U.S. interests. However, too frequently there is a disconnect between Special 301, which are the countries on our watch list, and trade preference programs, with some of the most egregious offenders of U.S. intellectual property rights receiving preferential access to the U.S. market despite their longstanding failure to effectively protect U.S. Cre credit, uh, creativity. So in my view, our foreign policy needs to be more coordinated and cohesive in this particular uh, resolve. Linking Special 301 and Trade Preference Program eligibility would provide the U.S. a powerful enforcement tool. We have a variety of trade agreements, free trade agreements. There are three pending right now, Colombia, Korea, and Panama. Uh, we, we want to work with you and your colleagues to see the three pending P FTAs implemented so that we can benefit from the negotiated IPR obligations of our trading partners. Uh, th they all involve IPR. In the case of Korea, they are v there are very significant improvements in their enforcement of intellectual property as a result of these uh, trade agreements, and uh, it's something that we think is important to us. While not a free trade agreement, the U.S. motion picture industry has a keen interest in the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, or ACTA, which is in particular uh, dealing with the issues of Internet piracy. And I would echo the, the comments that have been made about having more IPR attaches overseas in our industries. Above all, I guess my point in all of this is, is that this is a big, dynamic, important industry for America. It's very much the f a face of the soft power of America, our entertainment world. And, uh, Having you all engaged in this, having an enforcement team and a trade team and our U.S. government engaged in this, we can make real progress in dealing with what Mr. Bilbray calls the problems of China, which are just keep going and going and going. And, and although there is some uh, hope for some improvement there, but, but the fact of the matter is we've made progress in other places in the world and we appreciate your interest in this issue. Thank you so much and I was just talking to staff, we're going to plan another hearing and uh, where we want you uh, to describe just what plans have been laid out by this administration and the enforcement. That is so important. And uh, we were just talking about how we would line up the countries. I think China, number one, I mean, they're expert at stealing our intellectual property. Maybe Russia, number two, and Nigeria, number three, in terms of technology. So anyway, yeah, uh, what we're going to do is hold a hearing uh, probably after the first of the year. So I just want to let you know what our plans are. Mr. Hollyman, you may proceed, please. Madam Chair, Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Bill Bray, thank you so much for holding this hearing today. Um, the hearing is about protecting intellectual property rights in the global economy. But this hearing is also about jobs, it's about health care, it's about education, it's about the environment and national economic security. The software industry is helping to provide specific solutions to each of these national needs. 
The greatest value of what software is, is what software does. I'd like to offer for the record examples of several BSA member companies and the type of software that they're providing and developing here in the United States to help us meet these national needs. Without objection. But we also face a challenge of our own. Theft of intellectual property, both in the U.S. and overseas, is robbing us of resources that we could invest in more innovative solutions. Let me give you a few facts about this industry. It's a $300 billion software and services industry, the largest copyright industry in the U.S. and globally. 60 cents of every dollar spent on software worldwide inures to U.S.-based companies, and it's a source of American pride with over 2 million direct workers and a $36 billion trade surplus. But all of these benefits are endangered by software theft. The compelling statistic for today is that software theft reached $53 billion last year. Most software theft occurs when an otherwise legitimate business makes illegitimate copies of software for its use. When repeated millions of times by businesses and consumers throughout the world, this has a staggering cumulative effect. Harms of software theft include lost jobs, industry, and tax revenues. But what has been missing from this equation is the way this distorts competition. A company that steals business software has an unfair competitive advantage over an enterprise that pays for it. Both get roughly equal productivity benefits from the software, but only one is bearing legitimate cost. Software piracy is a problem around the world. It's particularly acute in many of the fastest growing developing markets that have disproportionately high rates of piracy. Let me talk about China. Wherever I travel in the United States and around the world, the place I'm asked about most frequently is China. In China, only 20% of software is paid for. In comparison, in the US, 80% is paid for. That means that there are a whole host of Chinese enterprises that are enjoying an unfair advantage over their US counterparts. This unfair advantage is exacerbated by the new industrial policies that threaten to shut out U.S. companies. And Madam Chairwoman, I want to thank you for your comments and your opening statement, for your questions to the government witnesses today. Um, steps by the U.S. government to ensure that providers of software and other innovative technologies can continue to have access to China as the fastest growing market in the world are critical. Companies in six critical sectors from software telecommunications and high energy efficiency products were given a December 10th deadline to apply to get on a list of preferred products the Chinese government will buy. We believe that few, if any, U.S. companies will qualify unless they turn over their IP to a Chinese entity. This could amount to a potentially massive transfer of IP, job, IP, jobs, and economic power. Madam Chairwoman, that is a step that is not in our national interest or in the interest of U.S. companies. China made this announcement just a few weeks ago. It violates a series of commitments. The administration is actively pushing back on this policy, and I urge you and the ranking member to strengthen their hand by expressing your own opposition to China's ambassador here in Washington. This issue is important not just to the IT industry, but to a wide range of business and governmental interests in the US and abroad. And indeed, I could add that it's not even in China's own interest to exclude their ability to obtain the best products from the US or elsewhere. In closing, I would ask all of us to begin thinking about intellectual property theft in a different way. The problem is more pervasive, it's more complex, and it's more pernicious than it was just a few years ago. Quite frankly, I think we need to think of another term other than the word piracy for this to talk about the breadth and scope of the problem. It has national implications, national economic implications, and thank you for holding 
this very timely hearing. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Uh, Mr. Tui, you can proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Bil Bilbray, for the opportunity to be here this morning. First, let me just say I absolutely agree with Secretary Glickman's and, and Mr. Holliman's statements about the importance of IP intensive industries. According to the Commerce Department, currently driving over 50 percent of our exports and 40 percent of our growth here in the United States, very important economic industries. Uh, pharma's member companies are innovators uh, devoted to developing medicines that allow patients to live longer, healthier, and more productive lives. Pharma's membership ranges in size from small startup research firms to corporations that employ tens of thousands of Americans and, encom and encompass both pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies. The research-based pharmaceutical sector is one of the most knowledge-intensive enterprises of the U.S. economy. In 2008, our sector invested over $65 billion in research and development, and of that amount, about 70 percent was invested here in the United States. The pharmaceutical industry supports more than 3 million jobs and directly employs nearly 700,000 Americans. To foster continued economic growth and deliver breakthroughs, our sector relies on policies that promote and protect pharmaceutical innovation, especially complementary protections of patents and data protections. Our companies face significant challenges uh, to the discovery, development, and commercialization of new medicines. Adequate protection of intellectual property, both within and outside the U.S., is essential for continued advances against challenging and costly diseases. In addition, access to international markets is critical to ensuring that these products meet, uh, reach as many patients as possible. In that regard, pharma members especially appreciate the continuing strong efforts of USTR, state, commerce, and PTO to promote compliance with international obligations by our trading partners. Pharma member companies also undertake significant research both privately and through public-private partnerships to develop medicines that disproportionately affect poor countries. In addition to research in this area, in recent years our industry has donated more than $9 billion to access to medicines programs, more than the entire foreign aid budget of countries like Canada or the Netherlands, and provided enough health interventions to help 1.7 billion people in the developing world. Currently, nearly 3,000 medicines are under development, including 300 medicines for rare diseases, 750 for cancers, and 109 to fight HIV AIDS. A recent Tufts study estimated that the cost of developing a new medicine at over $1.2 billion a year. And for every approximately 10,000 compounds that enter the R&D pipeline, eventually only one comes to market and can take as long as 15 years. Two complementary legal mechanisms in particular provide periods of exclusive marketing for new therapies. These mechanisms are essential to attract investment needed to fund the R&D process. First, patents protect inventions made in the course of research and development by giving the innovator the right to prevent the unauthorized use of inventions for a defined period of time. Second, data protection has proven essential. Clinical data represents the investment in conducting the rigorous, lengthy, preclinical and clinical studies that the FDA requires. One of our concessions made by the U.S. in the TRIPS agreement was to provide developing countries with a number of extended transition periods to implement new standards. As of 2005, all but the least developed countries were required to comply with provisions of TRIPS. Many of these trading partners have been benefited tremendously from the openness of our market and have industries that aggressively compete with our own. Yet even now, many of these countries have not fully met their TRIPS obligations to provide effective IP protection. Another important area of concern, which was discussed earlier, is counterfeit drugs. Weak regulatory and IP enforcement regimes in some countries uh, contribute to this problem, which increases health risks to patients. In addition to the failure to meet IP obligations, many countries erect barriers to reduce the access of, of our products. Clearly, these restrictions adversely affect the health of patients in their countries, but they also have potential negative effects on the United States and consumers world worldwide. We believe it is critical for the U.S. government to take action against measures that, defy, that, that prevent fair and equitable market access for our products. Pharma members believe the Special 301 process is a particularly useful trade tool through which these barriers and priority markets can be removed. In addition to Special 301, the administration should use all available trade tools, including bilateral and multilateral trade negotiations, to pursue a positive agenda on pharmaceutical trade. For example, the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement or negotiations included provisions on pharmaceuticals and specific steps to improve the transparency and accountability of the pricing and reimbursement listing process. We urge the administration to build on this success and include similar provisions in agreements with future trading partners. Thank you again 
for the opportunity to speak with you today. Pharma and, and its member companies believe it is crucial for this subcommittee and the government as a whole to foster incentives for innovation, both U.S. and abroad. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Tohi. Mr. Vargo. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Bilbank. Would you bring it a little closer, please? I certainly will. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. The uh, NAM is all about manufacturing in America. We are still the world's largest manufacturer. We make, uh, believe it or not, one out of every five dollars of everything made and manufactured in the whole world. But we're under a lot of challenges and a lot of threats. And the most serious, truly, is the threat to the protection of intellectual property. You know, the United States is never going to be the world's low-cost producer, nor would we want to be. We want to be the high-tech producer, the high-value-added producer. But we've got to have protection of patents, trademarks, copyrights. And those are under real, real threat right now through what I call the three C's, uh, counterfeiting, compulsory licensing, and China. And let me just say a few <laughs> words about, uh, about each. Um, the the uh, administration has, and the previous administration, have done a, a good job in increasing enforcement uh, and trying to intercept counterfeited goods. More resources are going on. Having Victoria Espinel, who everybody in the trade community knows and thinks is just a fantastic choice, very, very helpful. But there has been a major step backward that nobody has mentioned uh, uh, yet, and I, I do want to focus on because it may require legislation. When I first heard of this, I couldn't believe it. What uh, customs uh, officials do when they suspect a counterfeit shipment is logically contact the uh, trademark holder or the, or the patent holder and send uh, uh, photographs or descriptions, say, is this your, is this your product? Well, uh, the uh, Customs and Border Protection Legal Office recently sent a notification to customs agents saying you can't do that anymore. You cannot custom, you cannot contact the rights owners with photos or descriptions of suspected uh, counterfeit products because uh, this could uh, allow the facing of liability under the Trade Secrets Act. Now, to me, this is ridiculous. And if there is indeed some legal conflict here, I hope the subcommittee will look into it. And if we need legislation, let's do it. This can undo all the good. You know, if a customs official is prohibited from contacting, say, Square, the Square D Company, which makes excellent circuit breakers because they suspect that there is a shipment of counterfeit circuit breakers, well, you know, are these real? Did you bring these in? But if they're prohibited from doing that, believe me, the interception of counterfeit goods into the U.S. is going to come. Um, compulsory licensing. Uh, the country of Ecuador, for example, is saying now, well, you know, we need U.S. agricultural chemicals, so uh, we're going to just force, we're going to steal the technology there. Countries mm -hmm. talking about global climate change are saying, well, you know, if you want us to participate in improving the environment, you have to give us the technology. This technology costs billions and billions to develop. And the even better technologies of the future are going to require more billions. Where does this come from? It comes from the flow of funds by uh, having U.S. Uh, companies marketing around uh, the world. What these countries need to do is not say we want to steal your technology, but what they need to do first is to join in an idea the U.S. has promoted that, look, there should be an environmental goods and services agreement globally. What sense does it make for countries to put 20 or 40 or 60 percent import duties on, on clean climate technologies? You know, let's get rid of government interference there and then, then take it from there. Then China. China. Uh, based on customs data, we can estimate that 80 percent of the counterfeit goods in the world are made in China. China joined the WTO in 2001 and promised that they would provide an effective deterrent against counterfeiting. An effective deterrent. That means they were going to stop it. Well, now, eight years later, they haven't done it. They still don't have the laws necessary to criminalize counterfeiting. You know, it's an, it's an administrative procedure. You get a slap on the hand, you move across the street, and, you, and you're back in business. They have not cracked down on the, the corruption in the provinces where frequently you have local leaders in cahoots with, uh, with the counterfeiters. Um, you know, in, enough is enough. We, this, this has to be accelerated. China Customs has got to start, start intercepting the export of counterfeit goods. And then China comes along with the, the indigenous innovation product accreditation system saying, uh, you know, we're tired of using American technologies and British technologies and Japanese and others. We, we want Chinese. And the best way to do that is take our enormous government procurement market and close it off. So only indigenous Chinese technologies, those developed in China and owned by Chinese and that were originally registered in China, will be able to participate in the Chinese government market. Well, you know, that's blatant protectionism. This is what the whole world trading system is designed to stop. Now, on top of that, it was only a couple of months ago that China solemnly promised 
uh, in the Joint Commission on Commerce and, and, and Trade statement that China will require that, that products produced in China by foreign enterprises will be treated equally with domestic products. Well, you know, I guess that promise was good only for three months. Anyway, this is a very, very serious challenge. This could be the most serious challenge to U.S. manufacturing ever faced. So I uh, commend you for this, this hearing. Please stay on top of it. The NAM will. Uh, the best way to solve this, of course, is, is in a collegial way with the Chinese government, and we certainly hope that works. But one way or another, this is unacceptable. Thank you. To thank all the witnesses for your very informative testimony. And uh, I'd like to raise some questions uh, first with uh, Mr. Holloman. And um, I want to continue on this issue that we've been referring to uh, China's proposed uh, regulation on what's being called the National Indigenous Innovation Products. Uh, is my understanding correct that these regulations will require your members to partner with or transfer, transfer their IPR to Chinese industry <coughs> in order to qualify for government procurement programs? Madam Chairwoman, that's a perfect question, and, and this issue is moving so quickly, and um, fortunately the U.S. government team is mobilized very quickly to counter this, but yes, that certainly is the intent of those regulations that something would have to be completely indigenous to China, which would require the transfer of IP. It's certainly not clear that what any of my of members could ever, well, it's, there's six categories, computer applications and devices, communications products, modernized office equipment, software, new energy and equipment, and highly energy efficient products. And the understanding is this will be rolled out across a very broad sector of products starting with these. And so it's not clear that any U.S. company could qualify or will make the type of concessions that the Chinese are seeking. So this will effectively exclude them from the market uh, and certainly give hard preferences to uh, whatever indigenous innovation occurs. Um, are, are there other proposals still under consideration? By still China? under consideration. Uh, as with all things in China, China, it's not um, completely explicit and clear until it's seen. And in this case, it moves very quickly. But the business community, not only here, but in Europe, elsewhere in Asia and Latin America, and governments understand that this could be sweeping in scope. And what we need is this to be rolled back while there are further discussions with the U.S., the EU, and other major, major trading partners. Uh, are we still partnering, uh, discussing partnering in terms of the uh, membership of uh, China with the WTO? Well, they have made a commitment that they will join the government procurement agreement as part of the WTO. They did it when they entered the WTO. They've made it in uh, JCC to commitments to the U.S. And we believe that this action uh, is um, contrary to the spirit of those commitments. Uh, in addition, it will have a dramatic exclusionary effect uh, for companies. Now, do you think it would be helpful uh, for us here on the subcommittee to assist you in engaging our federal agencies, our China's diplomatic representatives here in Washington on these matters. A absolutely. I think that an outreach by this committee, uh, by the, you as the chairwoman and Mr. Bilbray directly to the Chinese ambassador um, urging uh, cooperation and trying to uh, hold these off uh, for pending further discussions will be useful. I know that the issue is now getting the highest level of attention within the U.S. government. Uh, one of our CEOs raised it at the President's Job Summit last week because not only does this take away the potential for job growth for American companies and software and other industries in China, but it could cost the loss of jobs that we currently have today if that large market is shut out for further procurements. Our ranking member, Mr. Bilberry, for questions. Thank you. Um, Congressman, thank you very much for broaching the issue that there needs to be a nexus between trade agreements and intellectual property. I think, uh, um, you know, looking at the, the lack of, of um, oversight in trade agreements 
in the past create a situation like what we've got right now with Colombia and especially Panama, where you got, we still got that trade agreement hanging out there. And I see why people are skeptical of trade agreements, because they look at, um, you know, the history of not maintaining some level playing field. Um, and it really does hurt when you got a great proposal like we've got with Panama, that they want to buy our bulldozers, Mr. Vargo. They want to build a canal with American equipment, and Washington's political structure is holding this up. When, boy, I, I tell you, if there was any agreement that I saw that should be a, a matter of um, signing, that was one. But because of the net lack of nexus, um, we're not doing enforcement. Now, the Korean situation, to me, is as close to a parallel, could become a parallel as China, as we see on the horizon. Um, the question is, is it just because, as we would say, too big to fail, that China's too big to confront now, that we are confronted with an 80% of world piring coming out of one political agency? And we can't say that they're not willing to do enforcement. We saw how effective they were with the milk-tainting situation. Um, instead of giving AIG pay raises, they take people out in the backyard. But you want to clarify exactly how we could be a little tougher on this? And well, first of all, it's a great question. I, I, I want to just mention. I mentioned this before. We have this conflict because we have these countries on our special 301 list, and yet the same countries are on our general uh, preference list. Right. One, for example, is Russia. Eight years ago, the U.S. industry submitted a petition to suspend GSP benefits for Russia, which has been on the priority watch list for the last 12 years, which has some of the highest piracy in the world. However, no action has been taken on the petition, and copyright piracy rages in Russia. Ironically, Russia is one of the fastest growing legal markets as well for U.S. products. So these, these are, as you can imagine, very complicated issues. China, my friend Robert talked a bit about China. We, of course, filed a WTO case against China for uh, basically inadequate intellectual property enforcement. We largely won that case. The Chinese are going to be appealing that case. And um, uh, I, I, I think one of the things that's helping us now more than what we've faced in the past is the rest of the world is coming along with us now. If, if it were viewed just as the US versus China, we'll probably wait for another 250 years to get really anything done. But if it's the rest of the world involved in this case, if they join with us on the manufacturing sectors, the pharmaceutical sectors, the automobile sectors, the, the entertainment sectors, and the agriculture sectors, then I think that we can have some impact. They are in the WTO now. And um, one positive sign I see out of China for the first time is a great entrepreneurial class that's building that wants to protect their own intellectual property and sees the, see themselves victims of, a, of, a, of an arbitrary government action in this regard. But it is not easy, and there's no, there's no simple solution except pressure at all levels, from the public sector and the private sector. And um, we've, it's had some impact in other parts of the world. It has not yet had dramatic impact in China. There's no question about it. Is the European Union backing us up on this they, now? They are beginning to back us up a lot more than they used to be. For example, well, that's <laughs> you know, well, for a while, you know, know, they, they, they let us fight the battles for them, as they often Europe's do. gotten into that habit. But, but now, I mean, Europe and the United States share many of the same perspectives on manufacturing and intellectual property issues. In the film issue, for example, there's a quota. China will only import 20 foreign films a year under what you call normal revenue sharing agreements. And the U.S. has maybe 13 or 14 of those, and the rest of the world has six or seven of those. Of course, you can find every, any movie ever made in the history of the world on the streets of China as well. But the Europeans are beginning to join us on those issues as well. And by the way, the Europeans are making their own positive movement in the area of piracy. You, you mentioned both France, UK. Uh, that are that are moving ahead, particularly in the area of internet piracy, and that's a positive sign not only for themselves but also how it relates to places like China. That's that's uh, we've seen very little movement in the past. Now let's get back to this. So this nexus between if you want to be our first class trading partner, you've got to be responsible to the intellectual property issue, and I see this as a major issue. I got scientists that have developed a new you know genetically altered algae that can produce diesel gasoline and jetco this is going to be a big deal in the next 20 years have we made that nexus nexus are we tying those together are we welding them together 
to where you can't be broken off. You can't play one game here and then expect to play the other game over here. I think it requires, quite frankly, a, a, a much greater attention to the inconsistencies that exist in the world trading situation and for the U.S. government to uh, uh, be a lot more consistent in its own approach. I realize there are a lot of political issues here that you have to deal with country by country, but uh, the disconnect, just the Russia example I've given you, and there's a lot of others in there where we kind of turn a blind eye on some things for maybe political reasons and our trade agenda suffers, that, that is something that we really need to move away from. And I, I, and I worry about it, Madam Chair, that the fact is the big guys get away with murder while the little guys like Panama are waiting in hand with everything we've ever asked from them. But because they're so little, we don't want to bother with, with the negotiations. And I just think it sends a really a wrong message. And I think any parent would, would never accept the same thing in their family. And I don't think in the international community we should accept it either. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chu. Mr. Uh, Tuhi, California is uh, home to many research institutions from well-respected uh, universities to biotech firms. And in fact, the state is home to 2,042 biomed companies. Um, in fact, the California biomed industry has grown from ideas first germinated in the state's first universities and it's flourished through entrepreneurial commitment and investor financing to create a very strong industry that's led to breakthrough technologies and therapies that have helped patients around the world. Uh, these businesses create high paying jobs and keep more than 270,000 Californians employed. Um, and all of this is dependent on patent protection that is strong. Um, how do the needs of the ph pharmaceutical industry uh, compare to that of the biotech and research universities? What are the areas where you agree on with regard to patent reform and where do you diverge? Well, I, I, first of all, Congressman, I absolutely agree with the importance of, of uh, to, to California and the leading role that California has played with respect to biomedical innovation, and, and uh, it's a growing engine uh, of, for the industry and for the world, and it needs to be protected. Uh, patents, uh, you know, patents and data protection and the whole suite of, of protections available for biomedical innovations are critical. They're critical to, uh, to universities, they're cl critical to uh, to innovative companies, uh, but we're finding in many, ca in many cases that these uh, patents uh, are not really respected around the world, and um, I, I would believe we share very much with biomedical universities the same concerns about the protection of patents and the protection of, 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 of test data protection. Um, you know, I, I, can, I would appreciate the opportunity perhaps to uh, discuss a little bit more with some colleagues and get a more complete answer back to you about some of the areas and ways we've worked with some of the California biomedical bio, uh, universities. But as I understand it, we very much share the concerns that countries around the world need to enforce patents, need to provide appropriate protection uh, for our clinical data. And in many cases, that's not happening. Um, the U.S. really leads the world in its protection, uh, and we're finding that 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 uh, that countries, even developed countries, uh, are are not uh, allowing the uh, the protection of IP and market access in order for all patients to be able to receive the medicines. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Glickman. Uh, many of my uh, constituents work in the film industry, either in set design, editing, or even acting. And I know how important a strong and robust film industry is to them, not to mention to the overall U.S. economy. Uh, I know the industry is working hard with international governments and the federal government here at home to ensure that intellectual property laws are adequately enforced. Just yesterday, uh, your organization was successful in helping to put an end to a notorious illegal website that was being operated in China after a two-year-long government investigation. Uh, this conviction of a Chinese couple is the most recent that you've successfully brought against copyright infringers on mainland China. What can we learn from from other countries? I, I know we've talked a lot about China and how badly they are they are protecting, but are are there examples of um, that are both good and bad uh, of how we can improve our enforcement system here at home? Uh it's a very good question. First of all, I, I don't want to say it is 100 percent bad in China. After we filed the WTO case, and the Chinese resisted, but there have been some improvements of training of IP judges. There's been some enforcement improvement. Uh, I would call it uh, not material yet, 
but better than it was five years ago. But there's a lot of uh, great stuff. So, so the, the pressure stays on. And what we find is the more the Chinese develop an indigenous film industry of local producers, local actors, local directors, their stuff's getting pirated all over the place in China, just like our stuff's getting pirated. So the more we're all in this together, the better they, as well as us, see the need to protect intellectual property. You go into, the, into these stores, there's a store in Shanghai called the Oscar Club. It's about 95% pirated stuff. Most beautiful video store you've ever seen in your life. It's not just American stuff. It's got as much Chinese stuff as almost anything else. It's got French, it's got <laughs> South Asian, it's got everything else. So the more we can get uh, the Chinese uh, uh, creative community involved, the, the better we are. But other countries are also taking a very strong lead, particularly in internet piracy. The French have adopted a system of graduated response where they try to educate consumers, and then if they can't get them educated, then they, then they they're, give the internet service provider a mandate to take more uh, forceful action. Other countries around the world are following that model. We in our country, we're working with the internet service providers very diligently uh, to get them to do the same kind of thing that is permitted under something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is the DMCA in which all of this is done. But this is a worldwide battle waged everywhere in the world. But there are two positive things that have happened that I must tell you. One is this used to be a music and movies issue. This is a comprehensive worldwide manufacturing software, pharmaceutical, automobile, and everything. And for the first time in the last four or five years, we are all working on this thing as an American issue. It's a gigantic American issue. Then in terms of the movie industry, we now have our, our unions, our guilds, our, our, the folks who actually work in the trenches all the time making these movies as much involved with us, the Directors Guild, the Screen Actors Guild, and others, the, 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 uh, well, all the, all the organizations that are there. So we're, we're finally beginning to get some political clout, both with respect to American industry generally, as well as within our own industry. You know, there's a lot of perception out there that our business is big movie stars, and that's it. 99.9% .9 of the people make less than $100,000 a year. They work very hard. They support their families. They're the people that uh, uh, Chairwoman Watson, uh, I'm sure, uh, that occupies her district by and large. So with that, you try to develop the political clout to be able to show that this is important to our government as well as governments around the world. So I, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to make this all the voice of gloom and doom. I, I think there is, there is a growing political clout to take this on as a very monumentally serious economic issue to this country. And I hope we can get your help, which we have, and the help of our U.S. government representatives to keep the fight going. Uh, I'd like to um, conclude with throwing this question out to all of you, and then specifically, uh, being that we are in the kind of financial crisis as a government that we're in, uh, would your industries that are represented here at the table be willing to contribute financially to our efforts as the government uh, through a dedicated tax or user's fee? So if you have recommendations that have not been mentioned, would you comment on those and let us know how we can pay, how you can help us to be able to bring these recommendations to fruition. And let's start with Mr. Holliman. Madam Chair, Madam Chair I think that the question for us is how do we drive more American jobs through protecting IP here and abroad? Uh, I think that the uh, companies in BSA are spending um, tens of millions of dollars a year uh, independently and then through organizations like BSA to do this. I think that a tax to cover this could be misused in other markets as a subterfuge for diverting resources into funds that were not focused on IP enforcement. So I don't think the tax mechanism, certainly in the current climate, is the way to do it. I think it's a will. I think it's getting the new people in place who are now getting in place and the support of this Congress to ensure that um, agencies understand this is an issue of American jobs and America innov American innovation. Madam Chairman. Yes. Um, American manufacturing is already the most heavily taxed in the world and it's one of the major problems that we face along, along <coughs> with theft of intellectual property. So 
I would, would not see this as a way to go ahead. But uh, there is so much more the government can, can do, both through coordination and through the trade agreements. Mr. Bilbray mentioned Panama, and he's exactly right. Uh, you know, the NAM likes these trade agreements because we have a manufactured goods trade surplus with them. We take NAFTA, CAFTA, Australia, and the rest and put them together. Last year we sold them $21 billion more in manufactured goods than we, we bought. So we need more of these. The government can do more to advance these. Every day that the Colombia, Panama, and other agreements language costs us jobs, it costs us, uh, costs us revenues. Enforcement of trade agreements, this administration is doing a good job in really accelerating that, and, and, uh, and, and we endorse that. Mr. Tui? Well, as, as, already, as already been, um, been stated, I, innovation is critical to the future of this country, and protecting innovation ought to be a core function of, of what the U.S. government does. Uh, you, you know, I, I think in some cases, countries around the world think differently about intellectual property. You know, intellectual property is um, what's well, the only right contained in the main body of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Article 1, Clause 8, Section 8. It's the only right. Uh, and we have it so much in the, our soul of our country, which allows us to really lead in innovation. And many countries around the world simply don't share that view. Um, we, as the pharmaceutical industry, have worked proactively uh, to, uh, and in many cases with partnerships with organizations like PTO and the State Department, to train judges in Latin America, to train patent examiners in China, to, to build that capacity. And I think it's a, it's a cooperation that we need to do more of, uh, and it's the right type of uh, uh, capacity building uh, that we're engaged in, but, uh, but protecting innovation ought to be a core function of the U.S. government. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think that's one thing we don't teach our children or our members of Congress enough about the intellectual property issue, that everything that we looked at what happened after 1800 in this country and how we basically moved on and beyond our, our mother country, which was the industrial base, countries like Germany and Britain, we know we're always we had a w big head start, but intellectual property allowed us to evolve. That's where we did get the Carnegies. That's where we did get new processing for creating steel. That's where the railroad systems were totally renovated by the American. That's where the automobile was evolved. The, all of the prosperity that we see in capitalism, we got to understand, was based on the fact of intellectual property protection that government's place in this great economic boom was to protect those in intellectual properties so that they, there, there was the return for the investment in in developing these new concepts. And I think we grossly underestimate that. And I'm glad you brought up the fact that before there was a, a um, the uh, Bill of Rights, before we articulated the rights of individuals to do and speak and, and possess certain things, the right to possess and protect your intellectual property was in our Constitution before all those other rights were enumerated. And that's an essential thing that we don't articulate enough, um, either in our classrooms or in the halls of Congress. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Glickman, we're going to give you the final well, word. I, I Since you say, represent an industry in my district, <laughs> we'll give you the final word. I just I concur with what uh, my colleagues have said. This is, this is a matter that affects the general economy of the country. So uh, I, I think that uh, if we go down the road of doing special assessments and, and special taxes for issues that affect our users' fees, or, you, or even user fees, uh, for for items that affect the country as a whole, then you know you could probably do you could all probably fund the government just by nothing else but special assessments, special user fees. I mean, uh, so I, I, I think that I, I think the question here is resources, but it's also a question of will. It's also a question of commitment. And what's so great about your hearing today is is that the message that's that's being shouted out from you all is is that. We need to sustain this will to take these, this problem on. And I can tell you from an industry's perspective, we are getting our act together without question. I appreciate that. And I just want all of you in the audience to know this is a very critical issue. And this won't be the last hearing, as I mentioned before. We're going to follow up. We want to know what's being done in government. And, uh, you know, we have a uh, theory of PAYGO, and uh, we've got a huge debt. China becomes the central focus, Mr. Vargo, as you mentioned, among your three Cs. 
uh, politically. Uh, we need their assistance in dealing with North Korea and uh, so on, the largest nation in population on the globe. And so it presents some unique challenges to us. But we're on it. The political will is there. We're going to continue to pursue it till we get some resolutions that are workable. With that, thank you for your testimony, panel two. Thank you for the audience uh, being here. And we will adjourn the meeting. Jerry sent a letter to Chairman Town saying maybe these 